Hi everyone, my name is Madeline Rolfe and I am an analyst at the Crime and Justice Consultancy Crest Advisory, which is the UK's only dedicated consultancy to crime and justice. Our team is made up of strategists, analysts, communicators and researchers working to offer strategic advice, performance framework, strategic needs assessments, to uh, police, police and crime commissioners, mayors, local authorities, and violence reduction units, for example. Um, today, I will be talking about a project that we carried out with the West Yorkshire Health and Care Partnership and the Violence Reduction Unit. Um, we used mixed methods research to conduct an analysis of the root causes of serious violence and exploitation of young people in the region. In this project, we set out to answer four key questions. First, what are the relationships and impacts of health inequalities, determinants of health, decreased sense of self-worth, and lack of autonomy in young people aged 11 to 25, and their potential to be involved in serious violent crime and exploitation? Next, what has been the social and economic impact of COVID on young people and the potential involvement in serious violence and exploitation? Third, what are the root causes that influence women and girls' involvement in different types of serious violent crime and exploitation? And finally, what does the evidence base around the impact of economic inequalities on serious violence and exploitation of young people look like? So to conduct this research, we carried out a quantitative analysis of locally held and published data, a meta-analysis of evidence on interventions and their theoretical underpinnings, and also a series of stakeholder engagements with both practitioners working with young people and young people themselves. Um, it was through this engagement that we spoke to over 50 stakeholders primarily young people. Um, and we also benefited from two youth ambassadors, Kem and Isha, who led a focus group with other young people and contributed to the communication strategy. They also wrote a spoken word poem, which I will be presenting at the end of this um, presentation. So what did we find? Our evidence suggests that there are five key and interrelated health inequalities that drive violence um, and inequality in West Yorkshire. So first, deprivation and socioeconomic disadvantage, trauma and mental health need, education attachment, the quality and availability of services, and finally, contextual and extra familial harm. So today I will focus on explaining our key findings, which is available through the uh, Violence Reduction Unit. To start uh, deprivation, we mapped violent crime against income and health deprivation to the lower super output area level and found perhaps unsurprisingly that most violence occurs in the neighborhood with the highest level of deprivation. You can see in the deep purple areas on the left map that where high violence crimes overlap with high deprivation. So looking at the map on the right, which displays similar coloring, you can see that health deprivation, so that is physical, mental health, disability and morbidity was perhaps more unexpectedly almost as important in the predictive relationship to violence as income deprivation. So we know that deprivation and violence are related, but our work unearthed three primary mechanisms driving this relationship. First, cramped or unsafe accommodation, financial insecurity, proximity to high crime areas and a host of other factors 
related to deprivation and poverty make young people more vulnerable to childhood adversity and poor mental health, both of which are key risk factors for violence. Second, and this was something which came out strongly in our youth engagement, poverty simply makes fast money you can achieve through crime and drug dealing more appealing. Third, and relatedly, we heard how long-term experiences with deprivation can shape the way young people see the world and their role in it. So young kids felt some legal opportunities were fruitless compared to the money they could earn from drugs and frequently saw uh, drug dealers as models as, of success. In the worst cases, uh, some young people said that they felt a legitimate career was unobtainable for them. So moving on to trauma and mental health, the relationship between mental health and trauma and violence is not straightforward. And we don't suggest that mental health needs make it more likely that someone will be violent. However, among young people, unmet mental health needs can make them significantly more vulnerable to exploitation and coercion and ultimately violence. We found three primary mechanisms here. First, anxiety and low self-worth makes a young person significantly more vulnerable to exploitation and coercion. Second, substance misuse, which is a really common symptom of ACEs, is consistently linked to violence. Last, another symptom of ACEs, which has a strong correlation with violence, is an inability to regulate emotions. And we found this uh, to be high among the young people that we reached out to. Um, moving on to education, we found that education attachment is also related to violence and exploitation. We know that attainment and a sense of inclusion are essential protective factors for young people and that poor education outcomes such as exclusions, poor attendance and bad experiences at school are disproportionately suffered by children already impacted by social, economic and structural inequalities. We also know that Black Caribbean children, gypsy traveller children and looked after children are disproportionately excluded so will often achieve lower marks, have lower attendance, and are ultimately disproportionately recognised in the, represented rather, in the criminal justice system. The same is true for children on free school meals and children with learning disabilities. So further research on um, education inclusion can be found in a SEP report which we published with the VRU last year. That was just a summary. Um, moving on to contextual harm, um, which was another prominent health inequality. By contextual harm, we mean that harm, that is the harm that young people face outside of their family from peer groups and community members, and the harm from poor accommodation, dangerous neighborhoods, and even rough sleeping. So here in this national analysis, we have modeled the index of multiple deprivation against the neighborhood level population estimates to produce an estimated number of children at risk of violence due to high levels of neighborhood crime and, and deprivation. We found up to 13% of the 11 to 15 population suffered contextual harm and that all five local authorities in West Yorkshire were among the top 10% of local authorities in England and Wales, both in absolute numbers and in terms of the proportion of young people at risk due to neighbourhood level deprivation and associated risks. Something else that stood out for us was that young people and their families face barriers to the support which could help protect and divert them away from crime and violence. So, for example, one youth worker in Leeds told us that part of being associated with a crime family means that you get stereotyped by statutory authorities and you may not receive the support you need. Some young people are also forced into crime because of their family connection. Often the way that young people 
who have experienced trauma and their families, um, the way they present services doesn't fit our conventional perceptions of vic victimhood. The young people who are prone to anger or flippancy and who might be withdrawn from services are the same young people who need support the most. Understanding this at the moment is not coming through some of the services and is making some young people and their families more vulnerable to violence and exploitation. Finally, I'd like to move on to women and girls. West Yorkshire has the seventh lowest arrest rate for domestic abuse and the third lowest charge rate for domestic abuse flagged crime among all local authorities in England and Wales. This means that there are significant barriers for women seeking to flee abusive situations and for women seeking to report their abusers or potential abusers. This combines with other gender-based inequalities such as pay, faulty benefit system, gendered societal norms, which make women considerably less likely to remove themselves from abusive and dangerous situations. For some women, this can incentivize them to stay in these situations. Finally, and this is related to the young women and girls that we spoke to specifically, um, women and girls have faced a distinct challenge, especially during COVID, when it comes to self-worth and well-being, which can make them uniquely vulnerable to uh, exploitation. So, what can be done? Uh, we identified multiple opportunities for the Health and Care Partnership and the VRU to use its leverage to further a deprivation responsive strategy in uh, violence and health. First, the development of a trauma-informed practice across partnerships, like the Complex Childhood Trauma Steering Group, which should be used to evaluate and standardise trauma-informed offering in West Yorkshire. Next, to develop a focus on accommodation needs for those at risk of violence. Third, the Domestic Abuse Act 2021 requires local authorities to assess the need and demand for accommodation-based support for all victims and develop a strategy to meet the support needs of victims. This means that for the first time, children are recognized as victims of DA in their own right and provision, therefore, needs to address their needs. Fourth, more and better mental health support should be provided for young people in West Yorkshire. And finally, developing aspiration-lifting programs that are focused on high areas of poverty and deprivation is very important. So to conclude, I would like to share a spoken word poem, which was written and filmed by our youth ambassadors, Kemi and Isha. Um, Kemi and Isha said that they wanted to contribute creatively to the project, and they wrote this moving piece to express their feelings on how violence and exploitation impacts them and other young people in their area. Thank you. This is a short spoken word piece titled Dear Younger Me. If I could say a few words to the much younger me, I would hope she would listen. This is what it would be. Dear the 14 year old me. I wish you would have understood what was happening and realised that nothing in life comes free. There's always a price for favours and friendships, the money, the drinks, the gifts never ending. They preyed on your weakness and showed you some love. But in return, what you did would never be enough. It started off small, just a move here and there. But a few months down the line, you were trapped and scared. At that age of innocence, you knew nothing of it. You thought you could trust them, but they used you for profit. You tried to get out, but quitting wasn't a choice. They took away your freedom and silenced your voice. As time went by, you became more alone. They threatened your family and damaged your home. You thought it'd be simple, easy and quick like they said, but the only way out was a hospital bed. Now I have said a few words to the much younger me. I would hope she would listen, that's what it would be. Dear younger me.